it's so nice to get to know you all a little bit. Um, I guess um, I, I guess I have to introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Isa, and I'm the founding director of the Foundation of the Sacred Stream. It's a school for consciousness studies in San, in uh, Berkeley, California, and I've been uh, teaching. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I developed uh, this process called depth hypnosis, and I've been teaching that and teaching the adjunct uh, programs that support it, um, energy medicine, shaman, applied shamanism, applied Buddhist psychology, and uh, a variety of classes um, in the transpersonal studies realm, such as classes on relationship, classes on grief and loss, and the classes on the sacred feminine. And this class actually came out of a set of classes that I teach to midwives, uh, doulas, uh, nurse practitioners, and mothers-to-be. Uh, two classes, one is called, um, the, the, main, the main class is the Tracking Spirit in the Birth Environment, where I help people try to hold on to the power of the Great Mother in the birthing process, no matter what operating theater they may wind up in when they wanted a home birth. Um, and um, I've written a book called Return to the Great Mother, which is about returning the power of the sacred feminine to the birthing process. Um, there's a, I noticed it was exciting to see my book next to yours, Bob. <laughs> <laughs>
want you know try to understand what is the great mother, what is the sacred feminine. We'll be working with, we doing quite a bit of meditation and reflection, and um, so we'll be doing some meditations to the great mother. We'll be actually under asking the great mother for um, a series of initiations so that we can hold her uh, knowledge more fully and. Um, the knowledge of the Great Mother that we're going to be focusing on here this weekend, and I'll be talking about all the different areas of experience that she mediates, but the one that we're going to be focusing on here is creativity. And we're going to be looking at something which I call the creative portal. And understanding what the creative portal is, what, what, what its nature is, what its requirements are of us um, as holder of the mystery of that information. And then we're going to look at managing the creative portals of your own life. I'm so excited that you're here, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sure, I'm sure, I, I, I know all of you are, are looking for some kind of inspiration and it's so exciting, you know, to see um, all of you engaged in these amazing things. And I, it's, it's like the most fun thing for me to be able to support people in doing what you're doing, you know, like in, in, in creating something creative in your life. So hopefully this, if this information will really be, be useful for you. And then um, we're going to look at understanding what dedicating ourselves um, and the power of our creativity to back to the earth could mean.
what we are doing is we are kind of taking a little bit of a dive into that, you know, we, we don't have anyone who has, who is really holding this lineage for a, this particular lineage of this very ancient school of mysteries that has, you know, that survived, survived Sumeria, survived Egypt, survived Persia, survived Greece, and went way underground with the Romans um, and Christianity. And, you know, we really, of course, we can always access the Great Mother through, um, through our own inner channels. And that's really what we're going to be doing, picking up this thread and kind of blowing the embers of it and bringing it forward again. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, follow, we're going to do, you know, a little bit of initiation work that is all part of the mystery schools. Of course, in the mystery schools, this knowledge that was taught about the Great Mother, uh, it was was hidden. It was it was safeguarded. It was secret, and um, the the kinds of experiences that the Great Mother mediates, uh, the sacred feminine mediates, are the experiences, and you find this in all of these different mystery schools. The processes of birthing, the processes of dying the processes of transformation and transmigration of the elements. Um, all processes, all types of alchemical transformations. Uh, always you find this esoteric knowledge of how to work with the elements in a particular way. And um, I teach a class, I mean, I teach a bunch of classes on elements, but there's a class that I teach in Hawaii uh, where we really look at how the earth works with elements and learn more about it. I'll try to bring in information from there. Um, um, uh, and also, um, well, you know, all the processes of creation are the, are the, are, are the areas that are held, uh, this areas of study that are held in these mystery schools. So, um, we will be, as I said, focusing on, on the creative processes primarily. But I'd just like to mention a few of the goddesses that you may be aware of that have been the subject of these mystery schools, some of them uh, from the lineage that I mentioned and some outside of this lineage. Of course, you, you have all heard of Isis, who is you know, one of the most important deities in ancient Egypt. And she held, of course, many different roles, but uh, she was very, very connected with the guiding of the dead and the processes of dying. And she was also connected with magic and healing. And then, I mean, I could go on and on. We could just do a class on ISIS, right? <laughs> Who would you do that? <laughs> um, but um, I'll go on to other goddesses um, because one of the important things to remember is that there is not a culture that I have encountered and, I mean, I have one of my first academic degree was in cultural anthropology. Um, that doesn't mean that I know everything there is to know about cultures, but I've studied them a lot and I haven't found one culture that does not have a mother goddess or a, 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 this concept of the sacred feminine. So I think that's pretty powerful and of course, we, you know, we understand, uh, you know, there, there's a good reason for that. <laughs> <You know? coughs> Sorry. Uh, um, and um, so I'd like to just talk about some of the other cultures where you find um, the, the mother goddess. You have uh, Durga, who of course is the Hindu goddess, um, who's, you know, not just the goddess of the earth, she is the goddess of the universe. Right, so she's not just like Gaia, not just Gaia, that you have in the Greek tradition, who is the goddess and the creator of the earth, but you have Durga in the Hindu tradition, which actually you know, is the, the female principle of creativity that is expressed through this goddess. And the study of her is to understand a lot about creativity. Nobody does gods better than the Hindus in terms of, uh, in terms of condensing all of these very cosmic concepts into uh, a, you know, something that is more reified or accessible through the nature of the 
God, and uh, certainly we could study Durga also infinitely. Um, then we also have uh, Nubwa, which is a very interesting snake goddess, with a, sometimes with a fish head and sometimes with a human head, that you find in the Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese mythology, and she's primarily associated with generativity, especially around reproduction. She's, um, uh, they, you know, she, she mediates uh, marriage, she mediates sexuality, and um, very, very involved with the, the generative uh, sexuality. I mentioned Gaia, who's kind of, you know, my peeps. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we spend a lot of time in, um, in the two classes that I mentioned uh, working uh, with Gaia. We'll spend time, of course, working with her this session as well. And of course, Gaia is, you know, the spirit of the earth, the goddess who, who created the earth. Um, in the Greek mythology. Then there's Koatlikue, uh, who is um, the goddess of the Aztecs, the earth goddess of the Aztecs. She um, is sort of like a Kali figure where she destroys things and <coughs> creates things. You've got that uh, you know, transformational aspect going. Um,
to be doing in the class is I'm going to actually ask you to find a place here at Menla where you feel the power of the earth most strongly. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to ask you to do some homework there. Um, you're not going to have a lot of time to do any, anything else, but, but <clears throat> of course you must go to the spa and you know, you know, do, do things like that. But you've got to go to your, you've got to find your spot to be with the goddess. And um, that, that I'll give you some homework as we get closer. Then of course there's Artemis. Those of you, you know, may know her as Athena. The, you know, she's the often depicted as a warrior and uh, one who is uh, very connected to the animals and who mediates the uh, relationship between the animals and human beings. And you find, um, you find Artemis uh, in Turkey as well. Um, and she's often called the Ephesian Artemis. So this is a very ancient goddess. This is pre-Greece. Pre uh, coming to us from, you know, across from India, Central Asia, Turkey, Iran, you know, Iran, coming, coming over to New York. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there's Frigga, who, um, you know, kind of held down sanity, you know, during the time of the, you know, Viking plundering and and uh, trashing of, of Western Europe. Um, you know, she's the goddess of the hearth, the goddess of the home, the goddess of uh, childbirth. You know, these, you know the, these, the culture of the uh, sacred feminine mystery schools have always had this balancing effect on uh, the affairs of men as they have been. Not that the affairs of men are, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I, of course we all have a little bit of problem with any kind of authoritarian structure that is unreasonable and excludes a lot of other people. But I, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm not here to trash the patriarchy. I think, I, you know, I love men, you know, I think they're great. Um, I, you know, and I, I think that, um, uh, but I, I think that they've kind of taken things a little too far in some times. <laughs> And, and in terms of fighting and you know beating each other up and beating up the earth and you know things like that, so it's really nice to have um, throughout throughout all these different cultures this counterpoint of the great feminine as this voice calling us back to the understanding of the creative generativity of the earth, calling us back to understanding the transformation and the transmigration of the of experience across the elements and, you know, reminding us of this aspect of ourselves, whether we're male or female, that can align with her and learn from her and honor her in order to be able to bring forward more abundance, more peace, more, more generative power. And um, one of the things that I really advocate is is actually yin power or you know female power like there there's been a loss of understanding about the nature of this power you know in the 70s you know we had you know women's lib you know and all that I mean I totally really appreciate honor and respect all of the work that was done then but there was there was a little bit of a misunderstanding about what the great feminine actually is, you know, as everybody tries to like be more male than the male, you know, it's like, yo, that's not power, you know, like that's, that's power over, you know, we are power with, that is the nature of the great feminine, this inclusive power that is, that, 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 that wants that generativity and that creativity to wash over everyone who comes into contact with it in equal measure. And there, there's a and there's a strength in that and there's a way to stand in that. And um, that is different than putting on a suit and you know toughing up the guys down at the office, you know. It's like it's, it's a different thing and we we're gonna understand more about what that is by Sunday, I promise. <laughs> All right, I think um, I think I've pretty much talked about my things. Do you want to talk about your things? <coughs> well, I mean, uh, I don't have a lot of things, <laughs> but um, and uh, I'm more here to learn. But you're making me think about what. Uh, 
But the Buddha was doing, in a way. Oh, that's okay. I'm going to do it. And, uh, you know, some images were coming in my mind as you were talking. And I remember that, um, you know, you see the statues of the Buddha that are most well known, where he's sitting cross legged, and he has one hand in his lap like this, the land of the hand of equanimity. And the other hand is down over his knee like this and touching the earth. You know that, that gesture? That's called the Bhumi's Parsha gesture, the touching of the earth gesture. What is it called? What? What is it called? Sorry? What is, what is it called? Bhumi's Parsha. Oh. Touching I the earth. I didn't know that's what it was called. And, uh, and um, what it is, what it, the, the drama is that the Buddha had been struggled with by the devil. His name was Mara. And, uh, and Mara was not like a kind of sort of devil from hell, like we, we have an idea. Mara came from a sort of heaven, I, I call it like a brothel heaven. <laughs> the cat house heaven. And he was like a pimp, you know. It's a, and, and he's, but he goes to tempt him. He can be ferocious also. He's a god. And so he had been challenging Buddha with violence and with seduction, and both had failed. So then his last shot with Buddha was, he said, uh, well, and then he tried to offer him kingdoms, and they a little bit like Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, very similar. And, uh, and then uh, finally he said, well, what's the big deal? Who asked you to be Buddha? What's this thing about you're going to be Buddha and save all beings from suffering? Who ever asked you? Why, where do you get off saying you're going to be Buddha? So then Buddha then replied, he said, well, how did you get to be head Mara of the Mara gods, you know, the, the demonic, uh, demonic or devilish gods? And, and then Buddha said, well, I don't know, you, when you were in some horrible state somewhere in, the, in, in hell, you, you, gave, uh, you gave something, you had a moment of altruistic thought about another devil, and you gave them something when they were suffering, some water or something. And so from that single act of altruism, you then ended up becoming the king of the, the, king of the Mara. So then the devil said, well, okay, you're my witness. That's my witness in my previous life, I did that. But you, well, what's your witness? And then, and then Buddha said, then I, millions of lifetimes, gave my body, my life, kingdom, my family, my head, my blood, a long list of giving things away to other beings, to help other beings, whatever they want. And uh, so now that I've done all that for all these beings, from beginning this time, I'm going to be a Buddha and I'm going to help them become free of suffering. So then Mama said, well, that's a long list you have there. And who is your witness? So then the Buddha touched the earth, and then the goddess of earth came out, you will sometimes see that in paintings, and uh, Prithivi, her name, which is like the Greek Persephone. You know, I like that you're tracing things back to India, I think that's true. So Persephone, or Prithivi, her name, so she started reciting the thousands of former lives of the Buddha. She said, I'm his witness, he did it here, I, it's, I've been supporting the whole thing, she said. And uh, in the more elaborate versions of Buddha's story, she came up, she had a chorus of 16 other goddesses, earth goddesses, and they all did a multimedia show of all Buddha's previous lives. And then, you know, you have an idea of like the devil, Mara, doing like one of those silent movie evil guys, you know, drat, you know, and going away. You know. he, he doesn't destroy Mara, he just he sends him away. And uh, so that image very powerfully came to me. And then in the, in the, the mandala of uh, uh, Anisal Yoga Tantra, there are four goddesses, special ones, who are female Buddhas, actually. They're Buddha goddesses, they're enlightened beings. And they go, call, one is called Buddha Lojana, which means the Buddha Eye. One is called Mamaki. One is called Pandala Vasinishi, who wears white, and one is called uh, Samayatara, the savioress, who the committed savior, savioress. 
and they represent earth, water, fire, and wind. And those four elements, of course, are not like just breeze that blows. Wind means movement or energy, period. Fire is, is temperature, heat. It isn't just the flame. Any particular object has mixtures of all those elements. The water is cohesion, and, the, and this earth is solidity. And then they connect to the four immeasurable realms of meditation that you can reach. Immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, and immeasurable equanimity or equality, and which is kind of complicated. And uh, but I actually experienced that a little bit when I visited Mount Kailash, to my amazement, because there these mandalas always open in descent, but it's a very barren, stark area, it's sort of the central mountain of the Indian cosmos. Uh, and they think it's the central mountain of the earth, really. They, they have, I know many religions do. And uh, so the idea that the mandalas always open, everything that is made of rock or soil is that goddess locha, is the Buddha eye. Anything flowing or frozen ice is the goddess Mamaki. Any, any warmth, sunshine, or fire that you that's uh, Mamaki. I mean, uh, uh, Pandavasini. And then uh, Tara is the wind, which most copiously there. Energy mm -hmm. the wind there. And they are always there. You see the elements as like the goddesses there. They, they're, they're working there, something like that. And somehow it's so, it's so appropriate. And then the third thing that I thought about. Uh, is uh, the 21 towers. And in the spa building, there, there is a big tanka made of applique, solemn tanka, uh, of all 21 of the towers. And uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, prayer, which we will read in, tomorrow, uh, about the 21 towers and how they are. And it is said that uh, the first two of them are the white and the green tower. They are born from the tears and the two eyes of the Buddha of compassion. Because the Buddha of compassion for beings, you know, being not wanting beings to suffer, that's sort of the whole job of when you become a Buddha. Oh yeah, well, I know what I want. I don't know about all the different, I'm doing my list, but I can, we'll get into this later. That's one main point I want to make tonight, that's right, I'm sorry, I'm wandering. Main point I want to do tonight is this thing about the, the form, the human form of the female. And um, it slowly sort of dawned on me in life that the, based on the definition of enlightenment, what is enlightenment? You know, people wrongly think enlightenment is some like super macho bright light routine. <laughs> you know, where like some light bulb goes off in the head and somebody sort of leaves the planet because they're just too smart for it. Something like that. They think <laughs> enlightenment is something like that. And, uh, Buddha, of course, uh, you know, he had that thing on top of his head, which is like an extra scoop of brains. <laughs> and somehow also it symbolizes that the top of his head is open to the cosmos, you know, that there's no top to his head. It's just pure light right up from his head. And everything is contained within him. In the image of the sort of well-known form of Buddha. But there are female forms of Buddha. There's lots of other forms of Buddha. But the key thing is, what is enlightenment? When you become enlightened, and every single person here is doomed to be enlightened, <laughs> fully enlightened, as the highest peak of evolution, whether you're Buddhist or not, doesn't matter, or human or divine or whatever, or any kind of animal, because there's no limit to life. <coughs> even they do a big crunch, even a black hole comes and swallows this solar system. People will be born in another solar system, another universe. There's no end to it. And no beginning to it. And we've been wandering here and there, and we've now become these amazing human beings. So, if, but, but when you become enlightened, what it means is you identify with the entire universe. That is to say, you expand your sense of who you are, and even your body, where the whole universe becomes your body. They call it the reality body of the Buddha. And that, and that means that when you become a Buddha, to your amazement, you're everybody else at the same time. You're the earth and planet, objects also. It's all you. And you're all, it's, it's, it's a oneness, which I love to say nowadays, is not the cheap oneness. 
The mystical one is I call it the cheap one. It's the bargain basement one. <laughs> Why do I call it bargain basement one? Because it's all one, because everything disappears in a blinding light, and there's nobody there. So it's easy to be one with it all. Because you're the only one who went into it. So it's all yours. And so what? And everybody else disappeared. And you also disappear, but that's all right, because you're the one who knows you disappeared. I call that the cheap one. And then you come back from that, and then you think you're enlightened, and then you go around, you know, and you ask for a Cadillac or a, a, a Rolls Royce or something, you become a big guru. But that's the cheap one. The Buddha enlightenment is where you are all one with everybody, and everybody's still there. Mm -hmm. So you are all of them. I mean, imagine, like I see you over there, and I couldn't hear your name, so I don't know if I did. Robin. I know your mom mm -hmm. is, is Christine. Mm -hmm. Robin. Rowan. Rowan? Ro Rowan. Rowan? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's like old Welsh, like sorcery. <laughs> okay, Rowan. Oh, nice. No wonder I couldn't hear it. Okay, so you, you and I are looking out of our eyes, you know, out of our envelopes. But when you're a Buddha, then you, you still can look out of your, the eyes that were previously just you. But now you're looking back at yourself from everybody else's eyes. You're totally in everyone else. You feel all of their feelings. You're completely one with everybody in their individuated details. And you're able to do it because for you it's a total bliss field. It's an ocean of bliss. And therefore, your compassion is the only thing, reason that you manifest to these beings as any particular thing. Because some of them, who you perceive as being made of bliss, they are uptight and they are pissed off and they are, don't have enough and they're freaked out, and they're frightened, and that, that's ridiculous. Because you can, but you can feel them feeling that way, and yet you feel their deeper being as bliss. So then all you, your whole function beyond that, infinite also function, is how to get them to open up to their Buddhahood. That they are bliss, that they are everything, if you follow me. Okay? Now, at first people think, when you think of that, which is a way to try to imagine a Buddha, you think, oh, that's ridiculous. How can anybody be infinite or beings? I mean, that's silly. But on the other hand, we know very well that uh, when a person is in love, they identify with the beloved in true love, not when they're obsessed to possess somebody or do some, some grab something, but when they're really in love in the sense that they just only are desiring the happiness of the beloved, which is how true love is defined in Sanskrit or Buddhism or whatever. That's love. So, but we've all had moments of that, hopefully. And when you are, you identify with the beloved. You feel they are one with yourself. And a mother identifies with the child completely, feels the child is one with herself, at least for a while. <laughs> and also same within love is for a while. And then sometimes even in simpler contexts like teammates, football, you know, or team, or you know, partners in other activities, uh, people rowing, and crew, you know, they get into it's like a one being, you know, and uh, unfortunately mobs get like where they become like all part of a sort of mass being. So human beings have the capacity, in other words, of expanding their sense of identification. And we've all experienced it even. And so we know that's possible. So all they're saying about what a Buddha is, to imagine, is a being who has systematically done that to the extent that they have infinitely expanded that. And in a sense, therefore, they are in love with all beings in the precise sense that they want them all to be happy. Because they are the same as them. It's like a natural thing. It's like when, when my hand hurts or you know, it touches a hot pot and I put cool water or salad on it, I don't think, oh, I'm so compassionate to my hand. Or I love my hand. No, I just, but technically that's loving my hand because I don't want to feel pain. Right? I want it to feel relief, right? So if that's your definition of Buddhahood, of the highest possible mode of existence, and clearly, if we live in a world where, which we notice doesn't work well, when everybody's out for themselves, right? Because they're always in conflict with each other, and actually every single individual loses because they're so, they're outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even they get to be president or king, or Donald Trump, 
Still, they're outnumbered, so they hate somebody. And they're afraid of somebody, right? They have to build walls and they freak out. So that's an unviable situation. So the supreme one would be for everybody who's inter-identifying with everybody else, and everybody who's in love with everybody else, and then everybody would want everybody else to be happy. I sometimes say, if you give an analogy of John Belushi's food fight universe. You know, usually in the sub thing, I have my mousse au chocolat, I have my ice cream. No, if you have a brother or a sister, no, you can't have it. Okay, I'll give you this piece, but I'm keeping mine. You know, whereas, when everybody's in love with everybody, here, have my ice cream. So you throw away your own ice cream, and you get deluged with everybody else's ice cream. Mm -hmm. That's the exchange, that's the opposite. Right? Mm -hmm. So now, okay, so if we could just visualize that briefly. In that case, the female form in the human life is more evolved toward that than the male form. Evolved. Because the female form, it has the, have this biologically wired to have the visceral experience of suddenly, you know, going along, I'm me and so forth, and then suddenly, and I want to have a, I want to eat a hot dog, and then suddenly, the reincarnation of a baby in their belly uh -huh. suddenly says, no you don't, you go have tofu. <laughs> I don't want hot dogs, I want tofu. And then you have a potato, oh, another voice is talking to me, there's another consciousness in here. And they're making me do something else I'm not used to doing. And so that the permeability of the membrane between self and other, the female is much more open to it, much more aware of it. And the dumb male is like, what do they do? What do they know? It's like, don't step on my toe. Which male is going to have a tall stranger take up residence, you know, squatter's rights in their belly for ten lunar months or nine solar months? Which male is ready to do that? <laughs> Not much less the labor of getting it out of there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I got in the natural childhood with my wife, I, and she was, you know, yeah, breathe there, breathe there, and then I'm pretty soon, stop, bring me, give me a spinal block if she doesn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in that sense, that's a, there's a biology, and according to a Buddhist observation of biology, Buddha was like a Darwin, Long before Darwin, he saw that the human being is totally interrelated with all the other animal forms. Totally. That, he was waiting for some British gentleman with a beard in the 19th century to discover the interconnectedness of animal forms. But and he was more interconnected, Buddha said, because each individual person, it's not that their genes are like a chimpanzee's genes, each individual person has been a chimpanzee many times. And all even other kinds of animals. So that was already, that's already common knowledge in India, from ancient times. And uh, so, then he, therefore he taught a kind of biology. And therefore, if that's the biology of coming to this peak of evolution, mm -hmm. where you are a completely benevolent being, in total bliss and self-satisfied, so with no desire for anything else at all, feeling bliss in every aspect, and being an ocean of the only thing then, that you have secondary energy of wishing to do anything is because you feel completely the other beings who are not in bliss. Because they don't know their true nature. They actually are made of bliss, but they think they don't have enough of it. And then it's, and you can't just go and give them a bliss hug because then they're paranoid and they'll think you're trying to like wrestle them or something. <laughs> so they have to open their own mind to understand it. So I'm just saying, in that light, when you expand your imagination, if, which is completely against, of course, materialism, where all we are are these bodies from birth to death, and we don't really have a mind and no soul and all that. But I don't think many of you are afflicted with that consciously. So in that case, then the female is actually the higher of the two forms of the human, and the male is the lesser, because more locked up in their sense of being separate from more alienated, actually, the male is. And more into their envelope and don't step on my shoulder, don't, my, don't step on my toes, sort of thing, or I'll shoot you, kind of thing. And uh, that's very relevant to right now. Because you have to, one has to also admit, on the other hand, all of the world religious traditions that we know, uh, we don't really know Buddhism as a scientific tradition. I, I do, Dalai Lama does, but most people don't. The thing is religion, and it has a religious side. 
and all of them have all taken form in, since there was literature, texts, you know, uh, urbanization, agriculture, Iron Age, you know, it's all these kind of elements of the recent thousands of years of history. And those have all been patriarchal situations where the males dominated by their greater general physical force, uh, pushing around the females, not, you know, thinking they are doing something, you know. And uh, although I'm sure all the great inventions in history came from females. Because those guys, they were sitting in a cave and uh, saber tooth that's out there growling, you know. And then some woman who was tending the fire noticed that the point of the, of the stick that she was putting there got harder when it was hurt by fire. And she was trying to make some food, so she was created the point on the wood. <laughs> and she said, well, dear, I think if you took one of these and went out there and stuck it at the tiger, maybe you'd be cool. <laughs> then you could bring in some tiger dinner. Oh, right, dear. And he was down with a stick. Otherwise, he never would have thought of it. <laughs> you know, I actually think so. <laughs> so. So that's my thing about it. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things, actually. And then, let me end with the one thing that liberates beings from suffering, which is only caused by ignorance from Buddha's point of view, which is ignorance not just being a failure to know how many boards on the floor here, how many atoms in the room, etc. Ignorance meaning a misknowing. Everyone knows I'm different from everybody else. They think that's true. I'm me. I'm really me. And I'm really different. And everyone else is different. But that's a misnomer, according to words. That, and that, that's a deadly misnomer, because it puts you in the deadly spot of being outnumbered by everybody else and everything else and losing the battle, the struggle with them. And uh, so uh, the one thing that liberates one from that Call, root cause of suffering is wisdom. And wisdom doesn't mean be, well, observing the groundhog and how long is the winter and even how short is the winter, we have to say nowadays. It's not that. Wisdom is not maybe not the right translation, I don't know. It means thoroughly knowing something. It means completely understanding something. Completely. And, and understanding it in a different way than just subject to object, or oh, I know that's a table because I can see it from this angle and I have the word table of something with legs and surface and you put things on and we call that a table. Not that kind of knowing. That's just labeling things. That's, a, that's egocentric knowing. Imposing my concept on things. The deep knowing is when you merge with the table. You feel the whole, you're like a cat scan. You feel the whole essence of the table because you identify. You wrap your consciousness around the table. That's true knowing. And that's called prajna in Buddhism. And transcendent knowing, prajna paramita, is a goddess. And she's called the mother. If anybody is a great mother, there is the goddess of earth and all that. She's, they are great mothers in their own context. But the great mother of, of, of the result of, of, of human and animal, all animals achieving freedom from suffering and bliss, with the vision of, which is possible from Buddha's point of view. The great mother of all Buddhas, in other words, is Prajna Paramita, transcendent wisdom. And she's sometimes presented with two arms, sometimes she has eight arms, sometimes she has a bow and arrow, and she's also a text. She's a thousand verse text that goes on and on and on about emptiness and selflessness, which doesn't mean that people don't exist or that they're nothing. It's very different from nothing. It means that, that people are open to transformation. They're pure relational continuum. They're flow beings. And there's no limit to how vast their flow can become. And they, she's the mother of that. So they all have come from her womb of, her womb of compassion. And that relates to my favorite phrase in all of Buddha's teaching, Sanskrit word, shunyata karana garbha, which shunyata means emptiness. And emptiness is, means actually comes from the Indo-European word shvi, which means to sweat. So when a seed is moistened and sweat, then there's an empty space inside it. And then that makes it fertile. And it plants it, right? The water. Otherwise it's a flat dry thing. And so emptiness is a kind of fertile emptiness, not just a nothing. And then karana which means compassion. And 
the last word, Garba, the nail chauvinist translators and everything in all his languages are going to be translated as essence. But actually, Garba means womb. And it can also mean the fetus, because the ancient people were very confused. <laughs> because the males, because of the men. And like, who, where did that baby come from? What's it come from me? It's mine. And uh, oh, went to that person over there. And, uh, no, no, no. I just sort of hopped out of my penis, you know, and then jumped out. And then now it hopped out of her, and now it belongs to me. So that's the male. There, you, you wouldn't believe some of the ancient things of what they think the birth process and the gestation process is. It's so ignorant. But the word Dharma means a womb. So this amazing thing is emptiness, the womb of compassion. And, and the, the idea of a womb being a nurturing membrane that is an infinite nurturing membrane that everything is completely enfolded in bliss. And that's, that's, that's sort of the, the kind of most highest expression of reality, actually, from the Buddhist literature, in my favorite book. Emptiness, voidness, of Freedom, emptiness, the womb of compassion. That's, that's, that's the thing. Okay? So that's what I'm, that's what I'm about. Mm. And, and, but as I said, I, that's just sort of Buddhism, normal Buddhism. But it's just my becoming from a typical chauvinist, waspy person <laughs> who, who my, my wonderful wife has been trying to educate and I'm only partially finished. Wow. I'm still not, I have not been accepted as her disciple. <laughs> over 50 years. But I am accepted as a novice, <laughs> close, to the, close to the doorway of true disciplehood. <laughs> because I still retain certain male reactivities. You know, like, huh? Uh, uh. <laughs> a little bit, I retain that. But I'm much better than I was. She, she will say, she will see her tomorrow. She will, she will. But I still need more, which is a tiresome for her, I, I still need more correction. So I'm here to learn. You know, you guys, you guys can teach me more. Save her some of the trouble. <laughs> Bob, you've taught us so much tonight. Thank you so much. That was a really very enlightening. Thank you so, well, good. so much. And it should be known. Of course, I do think, you know, the civilization of the goddess of four or five thousand years before, Maria Jambutas, if nobody knows that literature, G-Y-M-B-U-T-A-S, Maria Jambutas, she wrote the book called Civilization of the Goddess. She was a great archaeologist, European, actually Lithuanian, and ended up in Los Angeles at the museum there, uh, or the University of Museum, because when, you know, she initially discovered these invaders into Europe about 5,000, 8,000 years ago, warrior men, you know, out of Central Asia, you know, and but before then, after she did discovered that, they all honored her all over Europe. She was great, like the queen of all archaeologists, female archaeologists. But then she dug deeper. She found ninety thousand years of matriarchal, of matrilineal civilization with no fortification of the cities, with no crushed skulls and military, you know, war victims, some broken bones, you know, much gentler history. And I think that was the same in India and in China. And, uh, and so there is that. But somehow it didn't last, and the men came and made a mess. So it means that it wasn't perfect. Or as the famous Zen master in San Francisco said, everything is perfect, but there's always a little room for improvement. <laughs> and so then the men have been beating everybody up and chumping around for a long time. And what we're looking for now is a balance, maybe, a partnership. And there I really admire Rihanna Eisler, who wrote The Chalice and the Blade, and has a foundation, I think, a partnership foundation, it's called In California. And she popularized the work of Maria Jambuta, Rihanna Eisler, E-I-S-L-E-R. And she wrote that Chalice and the Blade. And she argues that we need now, you know, we need a female president, we need Angela Merkel to be the president of Saudi Arabia, <laughs> get rid of those slobs. And we need to, the women have to get in and like tell people, the men to calm down. And uh, then they'll be, men will be happier and be less violent. And it'll all be fine. 
So we don't want dominance to either way, I think it's what they say. Or maybe that's just yeah. putting the men at ease so they'll cool down. <laughs> and then we do need naturally now. I don't know. But uh, but that's what we need, I think. And so Where did the Maria Jambutis used to teach? What? Where did <coughs> Maria then, uh, you know, used to teach? Uh, Maria Jambutis has passed away. I but she used to teach at UCLA in America. Before that, she was in Paris and London. She was the absolute dean of all archaeologists until she started speaking up about the female-dominated society yeah. being excellent. No, you don't think she taught it. And then they, they they started attacking her. Do you think she taught at Eslin? I don't I'm think. I'm trying so. to remember. Eisler, Rihanna Eisler probably did. Did yes, certainly she did, but not uh, not the Jebutas. I don't think so. She wasn't kind of discovered, uh, you know, until she passed away. And Rihanna Eisler popularized yeah, her work. Yeah, she did. And Confucius is terrified of females. Mm -hmm. And even in ancient China, you know, also the females were the oracles. That Nu Gua, she talks about her tortoise shell and stuff. But, but they, the females would get go into trance, like in the mystery school. And then they would tell people where things were at. And then when the males took over, they had to have the I Ching, and they would burn some tortoise shell and look at the cracks, and they would do all kinds of divination like that. Because they didn't have the direct intuition of the female, because they're more stupid. <laughs> <laughs> they can be nice, but they're a little dumber. But you all know that, you're all female. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's it. I talked enough. And if I don't get home, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to go ahead and close circle. Um, but what I'd like to check with you is uh, what do you think about? Uh, doing the channeling tomorrow at four. Is that a good idea? Is, it, is there anyone?